I put over us this morning, before I start, a passage of scripture, which comes from the story I'll tell in a moment. But I think more than that, it's a scripture that could be written, should be written, over the church, not only in our country, but in many countries, who struggle um, for their existence. This verse says, Then the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another. And it will crush all those empires and bring them to an end. But the kingdom itself will endure forever. May I tell you a story? A long, long time ago, there lived a king of a vast empire. His empire stretched for thousands of miles, consumed many different countries. He was a good-natured king, but he was ambitious. Means he loved growth. He wanted more land, more power, more gold. And when someone opposed him, well, then he lost his good nature. One day, he attacked a city called Jerusalem the capital of another country. And he took the king of that country off in bronze shackles as a slave to his own country. And then he took the gold and the silver from that king's temple back to his own country and brought it into the temple of his own gods as a sort of sacrifice to the gods who helped him win that conquest. Then he created a slave route that ran from this country he just conquered into his own country. So he exported by the thousands slaves from the nation he just conquered. One of those slaves was a boy named Daniel. One night the king had a dream, woke him up. He didn't know what it meant. And so he called the astrologers and the sorcerers and magicians into his room to explain to him the dream. They came in the middle of the night and when they got there, he said, I've had a dream and it troubles me. And I want you to tell me what I dreamed and then interpret it. They said, O king, live forever, but you need to tell us the dream and then we will interpret it. But the king said, if you can't tell me what I dreamed, how do I know you can interpret it? They said, king, nobody can tell you what you dreamed. Well, the king got angry. He said, you're wasting time. You're trying to bide time so you can find a way out of this. And in his anger, he ordered that all of the sorcerers and wise men and astrologers in his kingdom would be killed. Daniel, the boy, was one of the wise men. When the commander came to Daniel's room to take him away, Daniel said, Why did the king give such a harsh demand? This isn't like him. Well, the commander told Daniel about the dream that the king had. Daniel said, if you'll give me the night and then come back in the morning, I wonder if I can interpret the king's dream. Mysteriously, he gave him the night. Daniel went into a room with three or four of his closest friends and together they called on the God of heaven to reveal to Daniel what the dream was and what it meant. And when morning came, the commander showed up to take him away. Daniel said, don't kill any of the wise men. I think I can interpret the king's dream. Take me to see the king. When he got into the king's palace, the king was ornery. He looked at Daniel and said, can you tell me what I dreamed? And can you tell me what it means? Daniel said, O king, 
No one can tell you what you dreamed. But before the king could answer, Daniel said, but there is a God in heaven who every now and then reveals mysteries to human beings. And he has just revealed one to you. He has shown you what will happen in the years to come. And that is the nature of your dream. The king said, All right, I'm listening. Daniel said, You looked, and there before you was a mighty statue stretching to the sky with its head of pure gold. And underneath it was the chest and the arms of pure silver. And underneath that, in the stomach and the thighs, was made of pure bronze. And underneath that were the legs made of pure iron. And the feet, he said, were a mixture of iron and clay. And while you were looking at this mighty statue, you saw a rock, a stone, come from a mountain. Daniel said, it was not cut by human hands. And it struck the feet of this mighty statue. And the feet cracked. And the statue wavered. And then all at once, it collapsed. But this rock, this stone itself, grew into a mountain that covered the entire world. The king said, that's right. What does it mean? Daniel said, you, O king, are the king of all kings. The God of heaven has given you authority over every human being wherever they live. And so you, O king, are that head of pure gold. But after you will come another empire that is harder and stronger than you and more violent but inferior to yours. And after that will come a third empire that is harder than the previous, but inferior to it. And after that will come the fourth empire, like pure iron, hardest of any metal, that will crush all other empires. It will be more violent but it will be more fragile because it will be comprised of people that are mixed like iron and clay can coexist, but you can't unite them. This fourth kingdom will be comprised of a conglomerate of people from all kinds of nations and religions. And the only thing that they'll have in common is their unswerving loyalty to the emperor and to his vision of the empire. Then the God of heaven will raise up a kingdom of his own that will endure for all time and it will not be left to another. And it will crush all previous empires until they are dust and the wind will drive it away so they are gone without a trace. But the kingdom is the rock. The kingdom, said Daniel, is the stone that will rise to become a mountain. And that stone, that mountain will cover all the world. king 
when he heard it, stood up. And in that day, that was never a good sign. And he walked right at that boy. The guards stood ready, waiting orders to kill. And when this king got in front of that boy, he went down on his knees and he said to that boy, your God is the God of all kings. He is Lord of all lords, for he has revealed to you the mystery of what is to come. Ain't that a story? Come on now. Ain't that a story? Well, two more of you heard it. (laughs) Do you see why you want to put this story over every little community scattered across the world dealing with empires trying to crush little communities? Can you see why people that are hiding in order to worship would find energy in that story? God is planning a kingdom that will strike the feet of the empire. And the empire will collapse at the impact of the kingdom. (laughs) I can't wait. You want the rest of the story? You're going to get it. Before I tell it, collect your thoughts. What did you just hear? It's not real complex. What I heard is that this is a story not only of a statue and a rock, this is a story of an empire and a kingdom. And the two are crossways with each other. They are in conflict all of the time. And that is the history of the world. There is always an empire and there is always a kingdom at foot. I heard that the empire was vast and impressive. Daniel said it was dazzling and awesome in appearance, but the rock, the stone was small and unimpressive. But the difference was not in the size, the difference was in the origin. The statue was made by human hands. So it was an empire that was built on human ingenuity. And when all is said and done, it is nothing more than a giant human being. But the stone is cut not from human hands, but from something supernatural. And so while the empire is impressive, it is only human. And while the kingdom is unimpressive, it is cut from the mountains supernaturally. And because of that, the empire and the kingdom are headed in opposite directions. From the moment they meet, the kingdom will grow in its influence and the empire will lose its power and dominion and glory. It is only a matter of time. And when the empire falls... It will not be because the kingdom struck it on the head and crushed it. It will be because the kingdom undermined it. It challenged its assumptions and its foundations were rattled. And from that day on, no longer sustainable. It will collapse under its own weight. Now the rest of the story. Historians tell us that what Daniel saw that day in the king's chamber was in fact an outline of world history. That head of pure gold was the Babylonian empire. And when that empire was over, it was followed by the Medes and the Persians which was inferior to the Babylonians, but it was more harsh. And when the Medes and Persians empire collapsed, it was followed by the Greeks, which was even more inferior, but even more harsh. And when they collapsed, they were followed by the Romans. And the Romans of pure iron 
crushed mercilessly anything in their way. But they were brittle. They were fragile because the Romans were a mixture of people from all races and all different religions. Rome had many gods and the only thing they had in common was an unswerving loyalty to the emperor and to his vision for the empire. One night, 15 miles outside of Jerusalem. A group of shepherds were in a field and they, they heard an angel show up and the angel made an announcement. And in the angel's announcement, he gave this infant child a name. He called him King. He said, unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ. There it is. The word means anointed one. It's a phrase lifted straight from the Old Testament. There's 10 or 12 coronation psalms where the Old Testament Hebrews prayed for the one that Yahweh would anoint as king over the nation. Psalm 2 says, you have anointed one over the nation. He is our king and he is your son and you are his father. The angel lifts that phrase, the anointed one, the Christ, the king, and he assigns it to an infant born in Bethlehem. No one in the world knows who this child is, but his identity is crystal clear in heaven. He is given his name. He is king of the world. A year later, when wise men come riding into Jerusalem and say, where is he that is born king of the Jews, you can feel that the fight is on. Herod has already been appointed by the Romans, by the empire, to be king over the Jews. Now there is one, what, a boy who is going to be king? Herod is old. He's losing his mind. He's losing his health. In a last minute rage, this man that has already killed his wife, her father, his son, and an uncle goes on a rampage and orders every child under two years old to be snuffed out. That way I'll get the boy who will be king. In this moment, we can look into that one page and see how history unfolds. Empires will always do what empires do. They will crush their competition and kingdoms will always do what kingdoms do. They will run for their lives and they will hide until it is time. The boy gets up in the night and with his parents, they run off to Egypt. Six months later, Herod, who was trying to kill all of the children, dies a slow and painful death. Dies of an infestation of worms, they say, eaten literally from the inside out. But the boy himself is still alive. <laughs> he grows up to become a preacher. He stands in front of an audience one day and he says to that audience, the time has come. The kingdom is afoot. He tells people to seek this kingdom, tells people to pray for this kingdom. He says, lay up treasures in this kingdom. He says, live in this world today, the way everybody lives in that kingdom. The people start listening. They start showing up by the thousands to watch him preach. Never has anyone talked like this man, they said. And the crowds get larger and the expectations get more intense. And they say to themselves, this guy is the real deal. Maybe he is the one who is going to come and lay that final assault on Rome, the fourth empire. I can't wait. 
One day, Jesus takes a ragtag group of followers to a city known as Caesarea Philippi. The location is important here. It's a flagship city for the empire, named after the emperor, Caesarea, Caesar, Philippi. It's known to be a military outpost for the Roman army, and it's known to be like a Washington, D.C. in miniature. It is lined in that day with images and vestiges of the Roman authority. And there with a ragtag group of followers in front of them, Jesus says, who do people say that I am? I said, well, some say you're John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, maybe you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but you, who do you say that I am? That's emphatic in the Greek. You, who do you say that I am? I don't think we can appreciate what happens next without appreciating that vision that Daniel gave to the king. 600 years before, the disciples look at Jesus and Peter says, you are the Christ. There's that word again. You're the king. No disciple has called him this ever yet. He's been named it by angels, but never by one of his followers. It's the first time the word has come out of anyone's mouth. Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the king and you're the son of God. Jesus says, well, that's better than you know, buddy. The way he says it is, flesh and blood has not revealed that to you. That came straight from my Father that is in heaven. Do you remember that stone that was cut not by human hands, that was superhuman and not human? Peter, that line that you just said did not come from you. That came from something outside of you. It's supernatural. It's like you cut that not by your own hands. And when he hears it, Jesus turns and gives this little community a name that so far only the Romans have used. He calls them the ecclesia, the called out ones. The Romans used it all the time. They used it to describe the military who were called out from the citizenry to answer the draft, and they used it to Describe the voting block. People that left their villages, met in the public square, and voted for their officers. So the term ecclesia was used by the Romans to describe the military and the government. The only two forces the Romans thought could move anything. And Jesus lifts this phrase and he puts it over this ragtag group of followers and says, I will build a community that will be as loyal to me as the Romans are to the emperor. And this community will live by my teachings. I will not write laws that they will follow. I will write these laws on their heart so they will keep the law even when there is no law to keep. Even though they are a thorn in the emperor's side, they will be the emperor's best citizens because they will live according to my ways and they will spread my kingdom all over the world until there is a mountain of justice and righteousness that has finally landed on this earth. I think we've lost our vision of this. I think the struggle 
And the church today is a struggle for our identity. And we don't know our identity because we don't remember where we have come from. Church, listen to me. We are not a nonprofit organization. We are not a 501c3. This is not a tax-exempt status church. This is not something planted by the denomination and approved by the empire. This is not a country club for mostly conservative voters who have all of it together. And it isn't a hospital for people who can't get it together. This is not an outpost for social justice. And this is not a vassal for some political candidate to get his or her office. The Church of Jesus Christ is a fellowship of followers from every part of the world who gather around one thing only, loyalty to the King, Jesus. And we are loyal to his beliefs enough to practice them, even when they seem at odds with the empire. And we are aggressive. We take his mission and his ministry to every part of the world such that not even hell itself is safe from us. We are not holding on to heaven with hell beating on our backs. We are beating on the gates of hell with all of heaven on our backs. That's who we are. Not something less, however popular that may be. We are the people of the king. Say amen, somebody. Peter likes what he hears. His name is Simon the Zealot. He never met a fight he didn't want. And so when he hears it, he's all in until the next thing out of Jesus' mouth turns the conversation in another direction. The very next thing out of Jesus' mouth is, now don't say a word to anyone and tell them I'm king. What? What? I was on my way to the emperor. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I was going to put your flag up on the empire. Are you afraid of the emperor? Jesus, you can take him. What are you, Amish or something? Are you trying to form some little cloister out from society? wait a minute. Are you trying to redefine what a king is before this ragtag group of disciples pick up the term and use it wrongly? Listen to the text. From that time on, Jesus began to tell his disciples that the king would have to suffer at the hands of organized religion. And the king would be crucified and ultimately he would rise again on the third day. And when he heard it, Peter, who a moment ago said, you are the king, says to Jesus, no, 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 no. That'll never happen to you. Let me translate that. You can't let that happen. 
If you are the king, you cannot die. How can you rule the kingdom if you are crushed under the empire? You must do something to resist this. Jesus says to Peter, if you didn't like that, you're going to hate what comes next. Not only me, he says, listen to the language, but anyone who wants to be my disciple, wants to live in my kingdom, must deny himself and take up his own cross and follow me. For if you try to save your life, you will lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. Peter, when you think you're living, you're dying. But when you're dying, you are coming alive. In this moment, there is silence. Peter stares into Jesus' eyes. He knows full well what he has said. He goes into what I call Peter's dilemma. And in that dilemma, in that moment, the future of the kingdom of God is at stake. And the church then and now is caught up in that tension. In this dilemma, there is a contrast between two ways. One is a kingdom without a cross, and the other is a kingdom through a cross. And in Peter's mind, the only kingdom is the one without a cross. That's why he who just anointed Jesus king said a moment later, that'll never happen to you. He can't imagine a power that doesn't crush the empire. That is where we are today, church. In the last two years, this is just my opinion. In the last two years, I have seen Christian after Christian after church go after the agenda of the kingdom using the power of the empire. They are different kinds of power. You cannot accomplish the kingdom agenda with the power of an empire. What you get the kingdom with is what you get. Methods matter, tone matters, language matters, disposition and posture matters. We have somehow excused ourselves that because we have the vision right, we can use whatever means are necessary. In the process, we are winning battles but losing the greater conflict. We can't have the kingdom in the way we are going after it. The kingdom without a cross is simply another empire. It is bold and aggressive. It attacks. It shames. It cancels. It impeaches. It repeals. It uses the empire's laws in order to get its agenda done. It tries to elect its own empire so that one day the kingdom will run the world instead of the empire. That is just another empire. It thrives on its enemies. It feeds off of them. It must have an enemy and it must have a scapegoat. Its identity comes from the way it opposes something. Always what it's against, never what it's for. Feeding off the bile of its enemies. Jesus, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. 
Thanks for your loyalty, son, but that's the empire. Jesus, grant that one of us would sit on your right and on your left when you enter your kingdom. Jesus says in so many words, that isn't my kingdom. You want positions in my kingdom that belong to the empire. You don't even know what you ask for. Jesus says, in this world, those who run the empire lord their authority over people. But in my kingdom, We don't rule over people. We get under them and we lift them up. They get the glory. We disappear. The way of the kingdom is the power of God. The power of the kingdom of God is not in our ability to inflict punishment on our enemies. It is in our capacity to endure the punishment from our enemies. It is not the power to conquer. It is the power to love. It is not the power of revenge. It is the power of forgiveness. It does not control people with laws and rules from the outside. It gets inside of a person and changes their nature until they change themselves. It is slow. It is hard. It is frustrating. One step forward and four steps back, it will feel to the end of time as if we are making no difference in the world. But church, listen to me. You are the stone. And you are at the foot of the empire. Though you are different in size, Though you are small and unimpressive, your difference lies not in your power and in your size. It lies in your origins. You were cut not by human hands. So there is something supernatural inside of you that no empire can conquer. You must not trade that in for something less. You do not want what the empire wants. You don't have victims. Ever. Ever. You lift them up and they are new. In the heat of the struggle in America for civil justice, Martin Luther King Jr., he, he went into his little Ebenezer Baptist church in Atlanta. We visited that one day and it is not a large church. He preached a sermon called Love Your Enemies. And in this sermon, he looked at the people in front of him and he said, we suffer the rod of iron oppression until we are frustrated in the day and bewildered at night. He said, we suffer under the ugly weight of discrimination. But then he turned to that congregation And he said that God has given us a new kind of power. And it is not the power to oppress. It is the power to endure. We must find our power, he said, in our ability to love and to forgive. He said, forced to live in shameful conditions, we are tempted to become bitter and to retaliate with a corresponding hatred. But if this happens, the new order we seek will be little more than the old order. Do you hear what he's saying? 
If we win the kingdom with the methods of the empire, we have only another empire. Then he turned and he looked past his audience as if he was facing the world. And he said to our most bitter opponents, we say, we shall match your capacity to inflict suffering by our capacity to endure it. We will meet your physical force with our soul force. Do to us what you will and we will love you. We cannot in all good conscience obey your unjust laws because non-cooperation with evil is as much a moral obligation as cooperation with good. But throw us in jail and we will love you. Send your perpetrators of violence into our communities at midnight until they beat us half to death and we will still love you. But be assured of this, we will wear you down by our capacity to suffer and forgive. And one day we will win our freedom, but not only for ourselves, we shall also appeal to your heart and your conscience so that we shall, with you in the process, win our victory. And this will be for all of us, he said, a double victory. <laughs> it's worth saying. Half of the social justice activists today who quote this man in favor completely ignore this. And it's safe to say that a good half of the church today convinced that their cause is right have forgotten how the battle is actually won. We have fought our enemies until we have become like them. But my worry today, people, and I'm done here, is not for the activists and it is not for the church. My worry is for us. I'm thinking about you. There is almost in every person in the room today an adversary, an enemy who drives you crazy. There is some injustice that you cannot endure any longer. There is some cause that you believe in so deeply that you will throw almost everything you have into it. There is something you love so much you will protect it even when you shouldn't. <laughs> 